you as you know, to... there are several clinical trials currently enrolling people for PWS for their studies. Some of these trials are investigational drugs, others are behavioral interventions. A list of trials is available on fpwr.org, and I encourage you to visit this site to learn more about the opportunities that are available. Today's guest presenter is Dr. Eric Hollander from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, who will be telling us more about the CBDV study he is currently running. We will be collecting questions from the audience throughout the webinar and we'll answer all of your questions after the short presentation. Without further delay, I give you Dr. Eric Hollander. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. So again, my name is Eric Hollander and I'm at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center in New York. And I'm gonna be talking about a study that we're doing comparing CBDV, cannabidivarin, which is a new cannabinoid compound versus placebo in children and in young adults up to age 30 who have Prader-Willi syndrome. And I'm very grateful for the funding that we've received from the Foundation for Prader-Willi Research. And I'm grateful for the Foundation for Prader-Willi Research for allowing us to do this uh, webinar which can help to recruit uh, for subjects who are eligible and could benefit from the particular study. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So um, last week we uh, presented on a study that we're doing, which is funded by the Orphan Products Division of the Food and Drug Administration on intranasal oxytocin to target in particular the hyperphagia associated with Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the use of uh, CBDV, cannabidivarin. And this study in particular targets uh, certain symptom domains in Prader-Willi syndrome, in particular the irritability that uh, individuals can manifest, the repetitive and uh, rigid type of behaviors, as well as some of the social cognition difficulties. Turns out that both uh, the CBDV, cannabidivarin, and oxytocin both have some similar mechanisms of action in that they seem to have a therapeutic effect on this excitation inhibition imbalance that may be present in PWS. And both, both of the compounds also seem to dampen down this immune inflammatory response and decreasing the immune inflammatory response may also be helpful in uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. One aspect of these studies also is that we're looking at a particular scale called the, uh, the MERS PWS, or the Montefiore-Einstein Rigidity Scale for Prader-Willi syndrome. And in this scale, uh, we look at issues in terms of rigidity, which is sort of underappreciated, but still can be a significant problem in Prader-Willi syndrome. And other studies are also looking at uh, genes that may be associated with that uh, rigidity kind of domain in Prader-Willi. Next slide. So uh, CBDV or cannabidivarin is a phytocannabinoid. So what that means is that it's a plant-based uh, cannabinoid. It comes from the cannabis plant and is extracted, but it's one of uh, over 150 different uh, sort of metabolites or chemicals that can be uh, seen in the plant. In the, in the study, this particular uh, plant-based cannabinoid CBDV may uh, have different behavioral targets, and we'll talk about that. There's some evidence that the endocannabinoid system, which is the endogenous cannabinoid system, may play a role in different kinds of uh, developmental disorders, where this endocannabinoid system may be activated and uh, activation of this endogenous cannabinoid system uh, may be associated with some of the symptoms that we see and administering a plant-based cannabinoid or a phytocannabinoid might uh, sort of help in terms of resetting this system. The uh, phytocannabinoids uh, don't work through the same receptors that are seen in the endocannabinoid system. So in the endogenous cannabinoid system, we have a, a CB1 receptor 
that's in the brain, and we have a, a CB2 receptor that's throughout the body in the immune system. And this plant-based cannabinoid or the CBDV doesn't seem to uh, it exert its effects through the cannabinoid one or the cannabinoid two receptor. It seems to have effects on different um, membrane receptors like this uh, GPR55 receptor or TRIP receptor. So it seems to work differently than, for example, THC. And one a positive effect of this compound is that it seems to uh, reduce uh, excitation in the cortex and in the brain and to enhance inhibitory tone. And this balance between excitation and inhibition uh, may also be reflected by a balance between a glutamate excitation and a GABA inhibition in the brain. Cannabidivarin or CBDV does not have any uh, THC, and THC is the plant cannabinoid that uh, gets you high, uh, whereas the CBDV really doesn't have any psychoactive effects, doesn't have any THC, and really doesn't get you high. So it, it's not really medical marijuana. Medical marijuana has uh, significant THC levels in it. This compound CBDV really has almost no uh, THC uh, and then it, therefore is really quite different than uh, medical marijuana. I could have the next slide, please. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, THC can uh, get you high and THC is the compound in cannabis that has these psychoactive effects and can also be associated with certain side effects. So some people who uh, use a lot of uh, THC or cannabis can have psychotic-like symptoms or anxiety symptoms, or they can have problems with sleep. It turns out that uh, CBDV, CBDV seems to have opposite or reciprocal effects to THC. So the CBDV has an anti-convulsant effect that stops seizures. It has an anti-inflammatory effect, so it reduces this immune inflammatory response. It decreases oxidative uh, stress. The CBDV actually has an antipsychotic and anti-anxiety effects and can have some uh, anti-addictive effects and also uh, positive effects in terms of neuroprotection, for example. Uh, next slide. Also, CBDV, cannabidivarin, is very different from uh, CBD that you can buy in a drugstore or online. First, uh, when people get CBD online or uh, in different venues, that's completely unregulated. And there are a lot of uh, variation with regards to the uh, what's actually found in the product. So when you buy uh, CBD online, for example, over the counter, uh, sometimes there are high levels of the CBD metabolite, but sometimes there can be high levels of uh, THC. Sometimes there can be low levels of CBD. So there's not a lot of uh, standardization and they're not manufactured under good manufacturing processes. So there can be a lot of variability in what you're actually administering. Uh, the only um, particular brand of uh, CBD that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration is one type of uh, CBD, which is manufactured by GW Pharma called Epidiolex. And Epidiolex is a particular brand uh, that's been extracted from the uh, cannabis plant uh, and has high purity of uh, CBD with little THC. And that is approved by the Food and Drug Administration to treat uh, two rare forms of epilepsy. One is called a Lennox Gastaut syndrome, and the other is called Dravet syndrome. So those are two uh, rare forms of epilepsy. 
where uh, you know patients may not respond to the standard anti-epileptic type treatments, and the FDA has approved this epidiolex to treat uh, seizures in those two rare forms of uh, epilepsy. This uh, CBDV is uh, manufactured under good manufacturing processes. It's very pure. It doesn't include uh, THC. It's uh, highly regulated and, and has high purity. And there is an investigative brochure associated with this particular compound that documents exactly what are the possible uh, side effects that you can see and what are the dose ranges have been administered in different populations as well. Uh, and in the study that we're doing, we're using this uh, form of uh, CBDV, cannabidivarin, uh, and we have a investigational new drug uh, application that's been improved by the Food and Drug Administration to study its use specifically in Prader-Willi syndrome with uh, specific uh, dosing associated with the study. Uh, next slide. So uh, in our study, what are the outcome measures that we're using? You know, first of all, we're looking at the impact that uh, CBDV may have on symptoms of irritability. That's our primary outcome. It, it, it turns out that um, we've also done some studies with CBDV in patients with autism spectrum disorder. And uh, we're also studying to see what impact CBDV has on this irritability measure in patients with uh, autism spectrum disorder. And in this particular study that we're talking about now, it's a study of children and adults with Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, first, we're looking to see whether we can reduce irritability. And irritability includes things like uh, disruptive behaviors. It can include aggression. It can include uh, uh, self-injury, for example. Uh, like biting your hand, for example, or banging your head. And it can include things like problems with emotion regulation or tempered tantrums or meltdowns. The next uh, uh, measure that we're looking at is the impact of the, this uh, compound, the CBDV, on repetitive behaviors. And we have two uh, outcome measures that we're looking at. One is this uh, RBSR, the Repetitive Behavior Scale uh, Modified, uh, and we're looking at this uh, CY box scale. So those are both uh, measures of repetitive behaviors that uh, are helpful in uh, individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, next, we're looking at the impact of CBDV on the hyperphagia symptoms. It, it turns out that uh, CBD and CBDV may have some positive effects on reducing uh, compulsive eating or appetite and may have some positive effects on things like weight or uh, basal metabolic indices, BMI, for example. Then one of the things that we've been very interested in looking at is some of the rigidity kind of behaviors that occur in Prader-Willi syndrome patients. And this can include things like behavioral rigidity. You know, if there's a change in the schedule, let's say relating to a meal time, then people can experience a lot of discomfort, and then they may protest and then have a temper tantrum, for example. And the uh, change in the environmental schedule, a meal time, maybe behavioral rigidity. We can look at you know how uh, rigid. Uh, cognitive beliefs or a cognitive rigidity, and then we can also look at the uh, protest relating to the rigidity. And then finally, we're looking at some measures of global improvement in Prader-Willi syndrome, and we're using this clinician global impression improvement scale and the caregiver strain questionnaire to look at sort of uh, global measures of improvement with uh, CBDV versus placebo. Uh, next slide. So what are the uh, potential side effects of this uh, CBDV? First, um, the, uh, this particular plant-based compound uh, is uh, packaged in uh, an oil, and it's administered in a liquid form. 
and the oil that it's uh, packaged in uh, sometimes can have some mild effects on the GI system. Sometimes it can cause a slight uh, loosening, for example, of uh, bowels. Uh, one of the things that we look for also is fatigue. So uh, I know that fatigue and drowsiness may be important symptoms that occur in individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, often associated with things like narcolepsy or difficulty with sleeping, and then people can be tired during the day. We want to make sure that the CBDV doesn't cause an, any increase in uh, drowsiness or fatigue. Uh, you know, in the work that we've done with uh, autism, we haven't seen uh, significant effects on that. And then um, in the package insert, there are some individuals who have complained of some headaches. So we want to look at that as a possible uh, adverse event as well. Uh, next slide. So as part of the study, we want to demonstrate that there's some efficacy or some benefit and we want to determine whether the uh, effectiveness or the benefit outweighs any potential side effects. We are doing some routine uh, safety labs, which include uh, blood work. And this may be done at uh, screening and at weeks four, eight, and 12 during the study. One of the things that we're measuring, for example, is to make sure that there's no increase, for example, in the liver functions on routine blood work. We also do routine uh, electrocardiogram or EKG or ECG, which is done at baseline and at endpoint in the study. We have an independent data safety monitoring committee, which includes um, medical specialists and statisticians and other experts who have the ability to uh, review the data as it's coming in during the study uh, and look to see whether or not there are any uh, trends in terms of any of the safety data while the study is ongoing. And then um, we also have the study doctor who uh, has discussions with the, uh, the subject and family members in each of the study visits to carefully assess and make sure that individuals aren't having any side effects or adverse events. Uh, next slide. So here's the uh, design of the study. People are screened and they come in and they're randomized. When they're randomized, they either receive the cannabidivarin in this liquid form twice a day, or they will receive a placebo that uh, looks and tastes similar to the cannabidivarin. The study itself is of a uh, 12 weeks duration. Then after the active form of this study, then we take people off of the uh, CBDV or the placebo, and then we have them come in two weeks later, and we're looking uh, on whether or not any improvement or changes that occurred while they were on the active medicine, whether people uh, relapse or whether symptoms come back, for example, after they're taken off of the medication. Uh, next slide. So the study visits, uh, patients are assessed every two weeks. There's a total of uh, nine visits as part of the whole uh, study. The medicine and the placebo comes in an oral solution, and it's a weight-based dose, so people can get uh, 2.5 milligrams per kilogram as the starting dose, and then they titrate up to uh, 5 milligrams per kilogram, and then 7.5 milligrams per kilogram, and then up to a maximum of 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. Uh, over a four-week time period, and then they stay on the same dose for an additional eight weeks uh, during the length of the uh, clinical trial. Uh, next slide. In terms of the inclusion criteria, one of the things that I would highlight is that, um, you know, we know that patients with Prader-Willi syndrome have a whole range of uh, you know, weights. There are some individuals who come in that are overweight or obese, 
but there are other individuals who have good uh, behavioral control and they may not have a, a overweight or obesity type symptoms. And sometimes uh, families can be disappointed because uh, if, if they're not, uh, if the individuals are not obese, they may not be eligible for the study. In this particular study, there's no uh, BMI cutoff or weight based uh, cutoff. So even if people are not uh, obese, they would still be uh, eligible for the study. Also in some studies, there may be a nutritional phase criteria cutoff so that they have to come in with significant um, hyperphagia. In this study, there's no hyperphagia or nutritional phase criteria. So people can come in you know, if, if they have severe hyperphagia or, or if they don't have severe hyperphagia, they can come in if they have obesity or if they don't have obesity. Uh, next slide. Uh, in order to get into the study, though, you do need to have a diagnosis of uh, prado willi syndrome confirmed by the genetic testing. And patients may also have some level of irritability as assessed by this aberrant behavior checklist irritability subscale, because the irritability is sort of a primary outcome measure, and it's been shown that uh, compounds like CBDV may be very helpful for irritability. So that's our primary target, and, and people need to have some level of irritability or uh, to have some level of protest or temper tantrums or discomfort. Uh, often when there's a deviation from expectations. The other uh, interesting point about the exclusion criteria is that we are studying children and adolescents so age five to 17, but we're also including uh, young adults up to age 30. And uh, young adults, unfortunately, uh, often are not included in other studies, but um, we are uh, reaching out and including young adults in this study. Now, in order to determine whether or not, you know, this particular intervention or treatment is really effective, what we need to do is we need to try to keep other things uh, stable prior to the study and throughout the duration of the study. So people can be on other medicines or have other kinds of dietary interventions or behavioral treatments, but we want the, other medicines or dietary or behavioral interventions to be stable for four weeks prior to start of the study and then through the duration of the study. And then um, we also do a physical and laboratory test and we don't want people to have uh, active or unstable unsta medical problems which might interfere with the conduct of the trial as well. Uh, next slide. Primary exclusion criteria is if they've had a uh, investigational or research medicine in the 30 days before getting randomized in this particular study. If they've been on long-term treatment with uh, CBD or CBDV or some other treatment that affects the uh, cannabinoid system, uh, uh, that would be an exclusion. If their primary psychiatric disorder is the biggest problem and not prado willi syndrome, if they have a history of significant drug abuse, if they have a medical condition that would uh, affect their ability to participate in the study, and if they have significant blood or EKG uh, abnormalities. Uh, next slide. And if uh, uh, families or subjects are interested in participating in the trial, or if they want more information, they can contact our uh, study psychologist, uh, Dr. Bonnie Taylor, and her telephone number is 718-839-7530, uh, and her email address is botaylor at montefiore.org. So again, that sort of is the conclusion or the summary of our study, CBDV versus placebo in children and adults with Prado-Willi syndrome, which is funded by the Foundation for Prado-Willi Research and for which we're actively recruiting at this time. Uh, and thank you, Susan. I'd be glad to answer any questions that 
uh, may come up. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollander. As we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if you have questions, you're welcome to submit them to us by typing them into your GoToWebinar control panel. Those questions will come to me and we'll get through um, all of them today on before we, before we conclude the webinar. So um, I do have a few questions in the queue that we can go ahead and begin with. Um, actually, we have a couple questions here that are related to um, whether this drug is given by prescription or if it's an investigational new drug or if it is a supplement. Could you clarify that? Okay, well, it's a um, it's an investigational uh, drug. It's, it's administered as part of a study. We have an IND from the Food and Drug Administration. So it's not a nutritional supplement. Uh, and uh, it's... Uh, not available outside of this study. So it's not uh, something that can be prescribed outside the study and it's not included in other sort of nutritional supplements. The only way to get this investigational medicine is to participate in this particular clinical trial. For this particular study, is there travel assistance available for people who need to perhaps travel in? Well, that's a good, uh, it's a good point. Um, because uh, you know we have kind of uh, worked with other organizations that have helped us in terms of uh, travel support, and we have a budget in one of our other studies. In this particular uh, study, we don't have a large uh, budget for travel-related costs. So uh, currently, uh, we're not able to reimburse people for uh, if there's extended travel costs. We are able to you know, reimburse people for uh, local uh, travel costs. Um, I guess it could change in the future if we're able to work with some other organization that could provide some additional support for travel related costs for those people who have to travel further distances. Right. How long do you plan to be recruiting for, for this study? Well, we plan to recruit for at least uh, one year, maybe up to 18 months. Hmm. And what is the size of the study? How many patients are you looking for? We we're looking uh, for uh, 36 uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. And what will the next steps be after the conclusion of this study? If it if CBDV is shown to be effective for the, for its primary endpoint, what are the next steps? Okay, well, as I mentioned, we're looking at a few different endpoints. The primary endpoint is the irritability on the ABC irritability scale, but we're looking at improvement on repetitive behaviors or social communication or uh, rigidity or hyperphagia as well. I think uh, if the, the data looks promising, then I, I think that there would be an interest in doing a larger scale uh, phase three type of a study that would be a multi-center study that would then sort of aim for like a FDA type of an approval. Uh, so uh, I think if the data looks promising, that would probably be the next step. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hollander, for joining us today and sharing details on this study. As always, I encourage everyone to stay up to date on PWS clinical trials by visiting our website at fpwr.org. You can see here our clinical trials page. And if you scroll through the page, you'll see a listing of all of the different clinical trials that are currently enrolling. Both um, interventional as well as um, novel drugs are available here.